Who is this Jesus that we hear so much about? Who is He really? Sin cannot be in the presence of God. See, God loves us. And He wants to be close to us. Do we truly comprehend what that means? Hello friends, good to be with you again. I'm Pastor Joe Laswell. Welcome to the Bible Only. We're going to be taking a look at something that uh, uh, the Bible says about uh, deception. In fact, uh, the devil, you see, he's going about as a roaring lion that Peter talks about, uh, looking to whom he may devour, and he's bringing up all these deceptions. And, and I want to uh, bring one to your attention that is, I believe, is very uh, important one, and that, that is the independence deception. And it actually started in heaven long ago. But before we uh, begin our study, uh, we want to ask the Lord to, uh, to bless us with the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to bow your heads and your heart with me now. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study from your Holy Word. Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to be very present with us. We ask that the Holy Spirit be poured out into our hearts and our minds and lead us into the truth as we, we study uh, your holy writings. We pray that the Spirit will give us discernment that we may see the deceptions of the devil and that we may overcome them by grace. We thank you for Jesus, for his life of righteousness, his death at Calvary for our sins. We ask forgiveness for our sins, Lord, and that we may remain in the Lamb's book of life. We love you and we thank you for answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, James makes a, a statement that I've been pondering for some time. It is a familiar statement, really, to many. Uh, and because of its familiarity, um, I think we may not consider it uh, as deeply, possibly, as we probably should. And the statement is found in chapter 1 of the book of James. Uh, it's James chapter 1 and verse 25. It says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty... And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, it's a very interesting, I'm not going to get into all of the things that James is saying there, but uh, I've been thinking about that phrase that he uses, law of liberty, as it seems to be somewhat <laughs> of an oxymoron in our world today, the law of liberty. You know, we live in a country that is known for liberty, uh, it's known for independence and, and freedom, as well as law and order. In the grand scope of the eternal, is there such a thing as independence? This is a question I want you to uh, keep in the forefront of your mind as we go on. You see, Lucifer's argument was that laws should not govern beings, uh, but all are to be independent, you see, to do as they please. We see this same sentiment all throughout uh, the world and uh, sad to say even in the church today. Can we actually be at liberty uh, when living under the law of God? Are we free and independent or are we actually in bondage? This is what Satan was saying. This is what Lucifer was saying. And like I said, it's been... Oh, this has been the argument from... Uh, the very beginning, and it took actually the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth and His life of righteousness to give us the answer to those questions. There are many things that appear to be true, that appear to be the truth, but in actuality are false. Isn't that right? Have you ever had that experience? Solomon said in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, he said, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. It seems right. He's taken it in. He's looked at it, all the aspects. He thinks it seems right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In God's remnant people, we find two specific characteristics as noted in Revelation 14, 12. So there are things that, that seem right, but the end... The ways are the ends of death. And then here we have characteristics of God's people. It says, here is the patience of the saints. That's who's being spoken of. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are a people that keep the commandments, which means they obey all ten of the commandments, friends. 
Now the first commandment says of those ten that we are to have no other God but the Creator. Isn't that correct? Let's look at Exodus 23. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay? So it's very interesting. Revelation 14 says that these people are not independent. Okay? They're not independent. They are a people who are free but not independent. They fully depend upon God. They live by the law of liberty, as James was saying there. Something Satan says, or Lucifer said there in the beginning, was impossible. And this is what I want you to keep in your mind that Proverbs 14, 12, it may seem like it's right. That's what the devil does. He paints a picture that may seem right, but the ways of it are death. And that's speaking of eternal death. From the beginning of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, uh, there have been many who believe that they are totally dependent upon God, and yet they, in reality, were actually independent of God. The vast majority, I would say, friends, have fallen into this category, sad to say. So it behooves us to know the difference between uh, dependent and independent. Uh, I think you would agree with that. Maybe it's a little bit more important to you now. We want to know the truth. We want to be found written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, so we must understand this difference. I mean, so we don't uh, want to be in the wrong group. We want to be in that group that uh, uh, follows God, follows Jesus wherever He goes. I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> Have you ever considered why God made uh, this world? Have you ever considered that? What did he want to do in making this world? What was, what was the goal? What, what is it that he was wanting? One Bible writer penned an interesting statement about why God created the, the world. She says, How great the love of God is! God made the world to enlarge heaven. He desired a larger family. Isn't that something? Isn't that interesting? Why did God make this world? He wanted to enlarge it. He wanted a larger family. He wanted a larger family of created intelligences, not mind-numbed robots that did whatever they were programmed to do. And we know from that statement that in heaven, they have a family. We, if we are faithful, are destined to become uh, reunited with that family at some time. And in this great family of heaven, each one has his own individual personality. We see that on, on the earth. There are no two people alike. There are people that may physically look similar, but we all have different experiences. We have, we have a different uh, way of thinking and, and such. You know, each, think of this, each angel has freedom. But no angel in heaven today misuses that freedom to act independently of God. You realize that? In the family of heaven, each person has individual responsibility. Each person has freedom. But no one in heaven misuses that freedom to act independently because all are held together by the love of God. And more specifically, not only love for God, but love toward each other and and humility is the key. They're held together by cords of humility toward self and love toward one another. That's God's government. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Catch that? Meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Isn't that interesting? You know, the Greek word for, for meek is praos. And it means gentle or mild. You know, tame animals were said to be praos. They were submissive. They were harmless. One who is meek uh, intends nothing but good towards others. Now the Greek word for lowly is tapanos, which means humble, essentially. A, 
uh, person humble in his own estimation assigns himself a, a low position in comparison with others, doesn't he? He esteems others better than himself. And you know, that's the way Jesus is. In fact, if you had to boil down the character trait of God, that would be what it is. A person who loves and esteems others better than himself. Jesus isn't proud, is he? He, he is gentle, and when I say proud, he isn't puffed up. He's gentle. He's humble. There is perfect harmony in heaven with each one maintaining his own identity, uniqueness, and function, but with nobody acting independently. You know, when you think about it, are you not aware of the fact that even God does not act independently nor did any of His original creation. I'll give you a few quick examples of what I mean. I mean, we, we couldn't create the world, could we? Only God could do that. He created the world. But when He created Adam, what did God do? He left it up to Adam to give the names to all the animals that God had created. He wanted Adam to, to cooperate with him in his work of creation. And not only that, but God created the minimum uh, a number of people to populate the earth. And then He told them to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth that they were to populate. Now, God wouldn't have had to do that, would He? God could have created several million uh, uh, perfect people. But He didn't do it that way. I suppose all of us who are uh, parents can look back and think of uh, many failures that, uh, uh, that we have made. But in spite of that, God has never taken that responsibility away from the human family. No. As it was on the earth when, when Adam and Eve were created, so it was in heaven with the angels. God did not create a hierarchy. He did not, he, it isn't a dictatorship in heaven. He created a family. He created a family. In Revelation 12, verse 7, we're told that there was a war in the family there in heaven. It says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, that's Jesus and the righteous angels, fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels. That's uh, Lucifer and those who... Uh, followed Lucifer's uh, ideas about the government of God. And if you think about it, friends, and the government of God, there uh, could never have been a war in heaven if uh, God's government was a dictatorship. And even if it was a hierarchy, it would have never happened. Um, with an absolute totalitarian government, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, because God... Uh, is all-powerful and would have immediately destroyed all evil. That's what would have happened. The reason war happened was because the angels had total freedom of choice. When war broke out in heaven, God could simply have banished Satan from heaven on the spot, couldn't He? Sure He could have. And He would have, he would have had to go. God's uh, the Creator, more powerful. But God didn't do that. What did God do? God allowed the angels, as far as possible, to decide the issue. Every angel in heaven had to choose. What side are they going to be on? And then, not only that, they had to be willing to fight for that choice. They had to be willing to fight for the choice that they made. Now, we don't know how angels fight. <laughs> it says there was war in heaven. We don't know how they, how they fight. All we know is that it says war occurred. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon fought with his angels. In other words, there was no neutral ground. And really, friends, there still is no neutral ground in this conflict. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 30, He emphasized this. He said, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. There is no neutral ground. 
There's no neutral ground in this world. You're on one side or you're on the other. The angels had to choose. Every angel had to choose. You couldn't say, oh, I'm not going to make a choice. You know, here's the thing about it. By not making a choice, you really made a choice. Because Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. God allowed the angels to make up their minds and to decide the issue personally. That's the kind of God He is. He didn't just, uh, uh, um, for appearance sake, say, oh yeah, I created uh, them with freedoms, a freedom to choose, a free will, and then uh, force their will. <laughs> it's not the way God, God is. They were able to decide the issue personally. Even... Um, even after this war, when Satan was cast out of heaven, he was allowed to return to heaven, you know, to represent the earth. They had councils there in heaven. And uh, you can read about that in the what, first two chapters of the book of Job. Now, in those chapters, God presented Job's fidelity, and he challenged Satan's claim to represent the earth. Satan didn't represent all the inhabitants of the earth, you see. For God said, Have you considered my servant Job? He is a perfect man. You do not represent him. And evidently, the angels allowed uh, the devil to remain in heaven. That is, he was allowed to come to heaven whenever they had a meeting with the representatives of all the, the different worlds. He came as a representative of this world. But that time of tolerance, friends, uh, it ended there when Jesus was crucified there on Calvary. I'll share this with you from the book Desire of Ages. It says, uh, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Catch that? It was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. So, you know, after... Jesus died there at Calvary. The angels decided that Satan could no longer visit heaven as the representative of this earth because after the cross, only Jesus was allowed to be the representative of this planet. Now, I'm happy about that. What about you? <laughs> Today, there is a judgment going on in heaven and we have seen that God does not act independently and the angels of heaven do not act independently. So why does God need a judgment? Did you know that the Bible says that God knew who would be saved uh, um, and who would be lost from the foundation of the world? Yeah, go to Ephesians chapter 1 or Isaiah 46. You can read it right there. But even though God knew that, friends, and this is a key. People get uh, confused by this. Even though God knew that, He he could make a correct judgment, right? Angels do not know that. So even though God knew it and He could make a righteous judgment because He is righteous, uh, the angels don't know who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost. See? They don't have all the knowledge that, uh, that God has, so they have to keep records. And they have to review them. God could do it in a moment. But angels need more time. And God is willing to spend the extra time. Have you ever thought of it that way? He's willing to, to spend the extra time and, and the effort. So all the angels and all the inhabitants of the unfallen worlds can see that the right decision was made in what Jesus has done. You see, because sin can't go uh, uh, back to heaven. 
Sin is not going to rise up a second time. So there has to be a judgment made whether the people who follow Jesus and who are righteous by His grace are acceptable back into uh, the unfallen kingdom of God. Heaven is built on the principle of cooperation and unity. It has always been this way. It will always be this way uh, through the ceaseless ages of eternity. As the psalmist says in Psalms 133, he says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's a big happy family. You don't have an enemy there trying to provoke you. He'll be destroyed, see? Now, according to Revelation 12, there came a time when one of the angels decided that he was going to be independent, though, see? You have this family, you have cooperation, you have unity, you have dependence, total dependence upon uh, the Creator, on God. And then one of the angels says, you know, I'm going to be independent. It describes it in Isaiah 14 and in Ezekiel 28. It describes it briefly in Revelation 1, if you want to look at that. But he began what can be called, and I've referred to it sometimes, as an independent ministry. Have you ever heard of that? Independent ministries? Lucifer began an independent organization, and that was sinful. Because you're separating yourself from God. You're transgressing His law in order to be independent. It was a sin because it worked apart from God and His plans and His organization. So there was one who came along in a perfect environment, in a perfect government, and he began his own ministry in competition, in opposition to the regular established government and ministry of heaven, which had been in operation for ages and ages and ages. We don't know how long. Eternity. And when that spirit of independence came to this earth, this world entered into darkness and the misery of sin. The first temptation to Adam and Eve was the temptation to be independent of God. Do you know that? Let's look at Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now put that aside for just a moment. Let me ask you a question. Can God do anything He wants? Yes, He is the law. God is the law. The Ten Commandments are a transcript of His character. They are His character traits. God is the law. The angels are not the law. Adam and Eve, they were not the law. You and I, hey, we're not the law. We are all uh, uh, bound to the law, which is God. The first temptation there was one of independence claiming that Eve would be able to do whatever she pleased to be a law unto herself, you see. She would be just like God. Now, was this really the law of liberty or a false freedom? Think about that. It is what I call and have termed the independence deception. The temptation was that Eve would be wise enough, if she ate of this fruit, to act independently, knowing good and evil herself, without having to depend on God for any kind of guidance. Now, isn't it true that there are still millions of people today who believe that lie? Absolutely. The result was that this earth became a part of the independent government, the independent ministry, of Satan, which made things more than confusing on this planet. Uh, God is not the author of confusion, so you know Satan is. And nearly the whole earth uh, became loyal to Satan's independent ministry. Now follow me closely uh, here because when you try to reveal a counterfeit, it can get very confusing since counterfeits look so much like the real thing. Those who remained loyal to God became themselves independent of the rebellion that existed on the earth. Catch me? On the earth, 
The great mass of the population were independent from God. They were loyal to Satan's independent ministry, whether they knew it or not. So those that were loyal to God became independent to that rebellion. But because they were so few in number, they looked like the offshoot, you see, to those who were members of Satan's ministry. Are you following me? The people that were loyal to God were few in number. Noah, for example, uh, apparently <laughs> was alone. The rest of the world was independent of God and was following the philosophy of Satan and his leading and guiding. But who was really independent? Was Noah independent? No. The whole world was independent. They were following the leading of the devil. They were independent of God. Noah was the only one that was not independent. Just the opposite of the way it looked, you see. At a casual look, Noah was the only one that was not independent. He was dependent on God. But because there were such few people that were loyal to God, it looked like they were the ones that were independent. See? The others looked like they were all united. They were the establishment. They were the government. They were the church. And you can see this same kind of perception in the misunderstood belief uh, concerning uh, the separation of the wheat and the tares, the parable that Jesus gave. Many have been taught that the wheat stays right where it is, right there in the church, you know, in the field. And the tares are removed out of the field, out of the church, the field representing the world. You've got to be very careful, friends. But notice what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 30. And sometime we'll get into a study on this, a little bit more deeper study. Jesus said, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, and that's important, the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the wheat? No. He says, gather ye first, together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. And they leave them right where they are. And then it says, but gather the wheat into my barn. So, are the tares gathered into the barn, hence out of the field? No. The tares are bundled where they are, and the wheat is gathered out of the field and into the barn. Many are thinking that the field is the actual church. And that's the deception. And as long as they stay in the field, hey, they're going to be safe. We're going to be safe. But the field will someday be burned. Friends, we want to be gathered into the barn of, of God. Amen. That's what we want to. We want to, uh, to be there with God, with Jesus, in the family of God. We see that it has been that way over and over again. That the appearance, I'm hoping you're catching this, that the appearance was the exact opposite of the reality. That's why it's called a deception. Now, God is in the business in this sinful world of training people and, and getting them ready for heaven. How's God going to get you ready for heaven? How's, he, how's God going to get me ready for heaven? How do the heavenly beings operate in heaven? Well, the Bible describes a society where they, they love each other and they have humble cooperation with each other, like I mentioned before. Unity, cooperation, love, esteeming others better than themselves. There's no competition or independence there. Citizens are free, but they're not independent. You see, God's plan has always been for humble cooperation. That's why Jesus selected the disciples that He selected. He had to select disciples that were teachable, that were humble at heart. You know, we can only see the outside, but God can see the heart, read the heart. And God is trying to teach each one of us the character traits of humility and submission. You know, it doesn't seem easy for human beings to learn the character traits of humility and submission. But we all have to learn them. We're going to have to learn them. We cannot be saved because this is the character of heaven. 
This is what it's like in heaven. Every experience of, of life is to instill within us these precious traits of character so we can fit into the society that Satan forfeited because of pride and independence. You see, pride is the opposite of humility. And independence is the opposite of submission. You understand? The Bible has a lot to say about submission, but we, we don't like to read it. But I'd encourage you to read it anyway. You can start with Romans 13 and uh, study that sometime. But none of us can go to heaven if we have a proud, independent spirit. I mean, we're never, we will never be admitted. They'll look at the records of our life and they'll say, well, they're, it's not safe for them to be a citizen of heaven, to be a part of our family. We have to learn the lessons of submission, friends. Submission given in the Bible. Submission to leaders in the church. Righteous leaders now. Submission to leaders in the family. Submission to civil government. Su submission to employers. Uh, all of that is taught in the scriptures. The 144,000, that, that group of people that is spoken of in Revelation are people that have learned the lesson of submission. In Revelation 14, verse 4, it says, These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. That's part of what it says. But I want you to notice these followers. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Wherever He goes. They are in submission uh, to His authority. Period. End of story. They're in submission to His authority. And they will follow Him. They don't just submit until they, they go so far and, and then they, you know, they're not going to go any further. No, they actually completely submit themselves to Him. And this is what Jesus brought to us over and over and over. We have to be born again. We have to completely give ourselves to Him. We have to become dependent upon Him in order to be free. Isn't that what Jesus said? The truth shall make you free, not independent. It'll make you free. But that truth is Jesus, the Bible describes. He is the truth, the life and the way. And uh, by giving ourselves to Him, we become dependent upon Him, but we're free. Submission to Him. But I've seen people, friends, who, who submit and they... But they only submit for so, you know, so far. I've seen it happen with tithing, for example, or, or the truth of the Sabbath, the state of the dead, prophecy, dress, health reform, uh, all different kinds of things that the Bible teaches. Different people will go to a certain point and then it cuts so hard across their preconceived belief or their, their thinking or their practices and they say, nope, can't go any further. I'm not going to submit to that. The problem is they become independent of God, but to the world they look like they are, uh, they are the norm, see? That they are free. <laughs> that they have freedom and liberty. But the 144,000 that we're reading about here in Revelation 14 are a people that follow the Lord uh, wherever He leads. They don't say that they're just going to go so far. They follow wherever He goes, wherever He teaches, wherever He points. Do you want to be a person like that? If you do, then you have to learn the lesson of submission. The 144,000 are the people that follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They are free, but they're not independent. You see? However, if you look... At the first part of verse 4 there in Revelation 14, you'll see that the 144,000 appear to be independent. Just like it was in the days of Noah. It says there, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now what's that talking about? What's that talking about? Well, women in Bible prophecy represent churches. 
The 144,000 are those who have not been defiled by women. They have not been defiled with Babylon's, more specifically, who is the great harlot uh, defiling the whole world, as you can read in Revelation 14, chapters 14, 17, 18, etc. These people are not defiled with Babylon. They are not defiled with false religion. They are not defiled with false religious philosophy that is predominant uh, throughout the world because they are independent from the man-made traditions and philosophies. Because, see, they're fully dependent upon God. They will be thought to be crazy and fanatical, uh, offshoots, that is, independent from the rest of the world. But the reason they are independent of the rest of the world is because the world is on the wrong side in this great controversy. They are loyal and faithful to God. And they are in the minority. They are considered virgins because they have reached the point where they follow Jesus again. How far? Wherever He goes. Choosing no longer to sin. They represent a generation of people who have perfected characters by the grace of Christ. Now the Bible says these people are followers. They're followers. In this world, very often the reality is exactly the, exactly the opposite of the uh, appearance. From the beginning of sin, those who have remained submissive and dependent upon God have found themselves out of step and independent of the world, as Jesus said. Um, a love of the world is enmity with God, hatred. So there's that split. There's that difference. And like Noah, when the rest of the world remained independent of God, can you imagine what people said? They said, that man, Noah, he's all by himself. He's so independent of our authority. He's an offshoot extremist. Oh, he was once one of us, maybe. You know. But he, he no longer is with us. Have you heard some of the things he's talking about? Rain? Seriously? He's building a boat in his yard. But friends, actually, Noah and his family were the only ones in the world that were not independent. They were dependent on God. They were loyal and faithful to God. Let me give you another example here. In the book of Numbers, the experience of the organized church in the days of Moses is recorded. And there's very interesting lessons there that we can learn. If you look at Numbers chapter 14, uh, verses 2 to 4, it says, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return un into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. What's going on here? Well, they're murmuring against who? They're murmuring against Moses, right? And against Aaron. And what they do? They decided to select another leader. Instead of the one that, what? God had chosen for them. Remember that, that uh, uh, they sent 12 spies out into the land of Canaan and they came back and there were two uh, who said, we can take the land. And the other 10 said, oh, no, there are giants in there. And they came up with every reason why not to go in there, why not to obey God. And Caleb and Joshua remonstrated with them and tried to talk some sense into them because they were making the wrong decision. And it got really heated. Now stay with me on this. Caleb and Joshua became independent of the organized church. What was the organized church at that time? It was Israel, wasn't it? But Caleb and Joshua became independent of the organized church and the people in the organized church said, this Caleb and Joshua... They're not accepting the leader that we are choosing. 
Remember, they were murmuring against Moses. They said, let's pick our own leader, right? And so they said, they're not accepting the leader that we're choosing, and they are not accepting the decisions that we're making. I mean, we are the church, right? And so we're, we're just going to disfellowship them. Now, do you know how they were going to disfellowship them? You know how they disfellowshipped you from the church back then? They said, we're going to stone you. But here's the question. Who was right? Was it those who remained loyal to the apparent church and the apparent church organization? Or was it those who appeared to be independent and were therefore going to be disfellowshipped? Hope you're thinking about this. A couple of chapters later in number 16, Moses himself is accused of being independent and Aaron also. You see, they had at that time a representative form of government. A representative church government is when you have a whole bunch of churches essentially uh, joined together into what they call a sisterhood or, or a conference. And they each select delegates to meet and make decisions for the entire conference or sisterhood. And frankly, friends, that's all a conference is ever supposed to be. But the children of Israel had a, they had a representative uh, government. And they got together in this meeting with 250 of the leaders. These were leaders or representatives of the people. It says in the Bible that they were men of renown. They were people who were famous throughout Israel and the, famous in the congregation. Have you ever heard uh, that when the leadership gets together and discusses matters for the church, it's, it's just like the voice of God? Have you, ever, have you ever heard that? That is what the children of Israel thought too. They had the leaders. These leaders accused Moses and Aaron of being independent from the church and taking too much upon themselves without the approval of the church. They said, God has chosen this church and surely when the entire church through its appointed representatives decides on something, it is as the voice of God to the people. This is, this is what the, you know, their reasoning is and what they're saying. And they question, how can it be that Moses and Aaron, they don't submit to the authority of the church and the leaders of the church? How can Moses and Aaron justify their independent ways? Well, actually, friends, Moses and Aaron were not independent. They were the only ones that were really dependent on God. Essentially. I mean, you had Caleb and Joshua. But what had happened was the whole church had become independent of God. The appearance again was deceptive. The church body had become independent. The ones who were accused of being independent were the only ones who remained loyal and true to God, the God of heaven. Well, that could never happen again, could it? The whole church was united against Moses. It says in Numbers 16, 19, that they, they all came together against Moses at the door of the tabernacle. Well, you know, obviously God would accept their decision since the whole church decided it, right? You know, there's some people today that are still like that. They're still like that. They think that if the whole church decides something, obviously, it, I mean, it has to be right. I mean, obviously, God is speaking, and you've got to be in harmony with it. So God accepted it, and they had new leadership, right? Isn't that what happened? That's not what happened at all. God did not choose other leaders. And God did not submit to the pressure of the whole church. He said no. He said that since these people were... Get that. God said that since these people were in rebellion, if these people were independent, they would die. And they did die. Friends, have you ever really thought <clears throat> the fact that there is no committee... No conference, 
no general conference, no human authority or power on earth that has the authority to change one principle of truth. Not one. The Antichrist power, that is the beast power that we read about in the prophecies, thinks that something God has said and done, they can change. But God said no. God will not change it for the devil. He will not change it for Cain. He will not change it for Korah, Dathan, and Abiram here in number 16. He will not change it for Judas. He's not going to change it for us. God is righteous. Malachi says He does not change. God is seeking, friends, for cooperation uh, of His fellow workers on earth. But He has not abdicated His throne nor will he allow any church, any conference, any general conference, or anybody or anything to develop and assume kingly power over this heritage, which is his purchased possession, which he created. When we follow down through the Old Testament, we see this principle demonstrated over and over again. Over and over again. We could look at Elijah. We could look at David and Saul. That's a very good example. We could look at Jeremiah. We could look at Hosea. We could look at Amos. But let's go to the New Testament. Let's look at the ministry of John the Baptist. In Desire of Ages, page 132, it says this of John. <clears throat> it says, John had not recognized the authority of the Sanhedrin by seeking their sanction for his work. <laughs> and he had reproved rulers and people. Pharisees and Sadducees alike. Yet the people followed him eagerly. The interest in his work seemed to be continually increasing. Though he had not deferred to them, the Sanhedrin accounted that as a public teacher, he was under their jurisdiction. Isn't that interesting? A lot of parallels you can learn. The Sanhedrin was the highest earthly authority in the church. Why hadn't John sought their sanction for his work? Because the Sanhedrin had tried to assume the prerogative and authority that belonged to God alone, thus making themselves independent of God. And John the Baptist did not join in their independence by submitting to them. You follow? Look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when he saw many of the Pharisees, and this is speaking, John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come uh, to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Wow. <laughs> you see, they thought, these leaders of Israel, they thought that because they were descendants of Abraham, that they were a part of the true church. No matter what. No matter what they did. And John said, don't even think that. In fact, he says in verse 10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not forth, uh, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. John says the fact that you are the literal descendants of Abraham and the fact that you have the right name and the fact that you call yourself Jews does not ensure that you're going to endure to the end. The tree is not saved because it has the right name. It is only saved if it has the right fruit. Well, what does this mean to you and me? It means simply that every church, every conference, every ministry, every institution, every person, and every family that becomes independent of God will be cut down, period. That's what it means. Does this mean that God doesn't have a church? Well, of course not. God does have a church. He's always had a church. The church is His family. 
The church is the people that are not independent from Him. They love Him. They keep His commandments. They have freedom to choose dependence. Notice this. It says, where Christ is, even among the humble few, this is Christ's church. For the presence of the High and Holy One who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. Where two or three are present who love and obey the commandments of God, Jesus there presides. So where Christ is, this author is telling us. The Bible says that. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Where Christ is, there is His church. If you're independent of Christ, are you a member of the church? Oh, friends. It is those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes that make up His true people. The fact is that from the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. Faithful souls. Are you one of those faithful souls? Do you follow Jesus wherever He goes? The Desire of Ages, again, page 107, it says this, Not by its name, but by its fruit is the value of a tree determined. If the fruit is worthless, the name cannot save the tree from destruction. You catch that? If the fruit is worthless, the name cannot save the tree from destruction. John declared to the Jews that their standing before God was to be decided by their character and life. Profession was worthless. If their life and character were not in harmony with God's law, they were not His people. Did you catch that, friends? Do you see it? If their life and character were not in harmony with God's law, they were not His people. It shouldn't shock us. <laughs> Is Satan in harmony with God's law? No. These people who follow God, these people who live and keep His commandments, they live by the law of liberty. They were dependent upon God. You see, the problem was that the Jews thought and they were convinced that they were the grand exception to this rule. And many churches today believe that too. They're the grand exception. They believe that they were, the Jews here, they believe that they were heirs to the promise God made to Abraham just because they were related to him. Now, friends, is that any different with the churches today? No, friends. God does not change. And his promises are still conditional upon obedience to his law. It was true in Eden. It's still true today. Now when John warned the church that God could work without them, as we read earlier, in their eyes, you know what? He had committed the unpardonable sin. And they tried to silence him. They didn't accept him as a member of the church. Because to them, the church was the structure. It was the organization. It was the buildings and the human leadership in Jerusalem. That was the church. The system in their eyes was as secure as the throne in heaven. And this same attitude is prevalent today. I've had church leaders, <laughs> I've had church leaders come to me and ask me what authority I have to preach the truth. So it's remarkable. And I ask, where did Peter and John's authority come from? I've been accused of taking an authority that isn't mine, but like those men, like any Christian, I point to Christ and I point to my fruits. They speak to my motives and calling. And friends, I'm going to tell you, beloved, I'm going to tell you, there will come a time when each child of God will be accused of the same. Remember Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. you to notice this as we close up. In this fearful time, just before Christ is to come the second time, God's faithful preachers will have to bear a still more 
pointed testimony than was born by John the Baptist. Boy, John the Baptist was pretty pointed, wasn't it? She says, a responsible, important work is before them. And those who speak smooth things, God will not acknowledge as his shepherds. A fearful woe is upon them. Let me tell you, beloved, we have to learn the lesson that John the Baptist was teaching. And he taught that the axe is laid at the foot of the tree. He said, don't even think that you are a member of the church just because you're a child of Abraham because God can raise up these stones. That's the Gentiles. He was referring to the Gentiles. These stones to, to be children from Abraham. Who can God raise up? Anyone that is willing to become humble, obedient, and loving. Humble, loving obedience is all that's required. It's not complicated. The people who are really humble and obedient are to receive the seal of God. But you know, to the world, they're going to look like offshoots. They're going to look like they're independent. And the people that are actually independent from God and His government are going to look like they are the establishment, that they are the people God is leading. But the sad thing is, they will be the ones who receive the mark of the beast. We're going to have to get this subject straight in our minds, friends. We're going to have to Live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and follow the Lamb wherever He goes if we want to overcome the independence deception. And when you do that, you give yourself to God completely, unreservedly. The Bible says if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So friends, may we be dependently minded for to be dependent upon a God, to be dependent upon God fully will save us from the independence deception. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that you are loving, kind, and forgiving God, but you are also a just God and as well as a merciful God. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us our sins. Help us, Lord, not to be deceived from the devil, to be completely submitted to you and your righteousness and your commandments. And may we be found in the Lamb's book of life. Give us grace to follow Jesus wherever, we, wherever he goes and to stand for the truth, though others may fall away. We pray in Jesus' name. The Bible-only television program is a copyright of Eternal Truth Ministries. All rights are reserved.